really gonna have a fight over the last part because I didn't really understand what the guy was trying to do. <laughs> and I'm not really the, the competent guy that works on the self-defense. But I'm sure that when we get the de details, then we can make a statement or something like that. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Robert Lipovsky, and I work for Reset as a virus researcher in our lab in Bratislava. Today we'll be talking about rootkits. And uh, as all of, all of us know, uh, the days when malware was about uh, hackers bragging about how they own your system and uh, displaying wicked pop-ups and showing off to their friends, uh, th these days are long gone, and today it's all about money. Uh, uh, malware can steal more and better uh, when it remains on the infected PC for as long as possible, and that's where rootkits take uh, play their part. Uh, this is today's agenda. We'll we'll start off with a brief introduction into. Excuse me. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Is this better? Okay. So we'll begin uh, with an introduction to basic uh, rootkit techniques. Uh, then the second part, which you can think of as an interlude, will be a debate of what, which of these techniques have actually been implemented into real-world uh, malware and which remained as uh, merely as proof of concepts. And uh, then in the last and most important part, we'll look at the real crooks, uh, namely the Mebrut, Rustock, and the TDL, aka Omarik uh, malware families. Okay, so uh, the basic rootkit uh, techniques will be demonstrated uh, with the example of uh, hiding processes, uh, most simply because uh, processes are the primary uh, primary indicator of system activity, and uh, a couple, couple of years ago, this is what mainly malware was trying to hide. Uh, later, we'll show that it's possible to uh, do stealth a better, more advanced way. So, as an introduction, uh, we can get an enumeration of processes using standard API functions. The two above ones are uh, typical APIs. The other one is the native API uh, that's being called by the user mode APIs. Um, Processes can be excluded for enumerations by these API functions by hooking. Uh, native APIs can be uh, can be hooked uh, by hooking the SSDT table, uh, which is what this illustration shows uh, over here. Over here, we see the standard user mode APIs calling the under calling uh, the native API underneath. Uh, then there's the transition from user mode to kernel mode, and the serv system service uh, dispatcher looks up the address of the kernel function in the SSDT. Uh, if everything, uh, if there was a clean system, this would be the no normal behavior where the address would point to the kernel executable. In this case, anti-query system information uh, to get the list of processes. But when it is hooked, uh, the address is overwritten to point to a hook function. Now what that one does is that it calls the original one to get the list of processes, uh, traverses uh, the results, filters out what it wants to filter out, and then returns the modified output afterwards. This is pretty simple stuff. SSDT hooks are really, uh, really easy and uh, trivial, uh, both to implement and also to detect. Uh, by going lower, uh, we get to direct kernel object manipulation. That is actually how, uh, by traversing the kernel objects underneath, is uh, the way native APIs uh, get their data. So with the example of processes, uh, they traverse uh, the linked list of e-process structures, which represent each process. And there, there is an example of uh, those structures. They are linked in a double-linked list, which uh, serves only enumer enumeration processes. So if we want to hide from that, uh, it's just a matter of overriding a few pointers, where we point uh, the previous one to, show, to point to the next one, and the next one uh, pointing to the previous one, leaving our uh, desired process out. Uh, this again can be quite easily uh, easily overcome. Uh, then there is another 
uh, method of uh, getting a list of processes by, by hooking the swap context function, which as the name implies, is responsible for hooking the swap, uh, for swapping the context of uh, the threads that are being scheduled to run. Uh, this swap context function takes two parameters, uh, the, the, the address of the ether that's being swapped in and the address that's uh, of the ether that's being swapped out. And uh, if we intercept that, we can get through the ethread structure to its uh, corresponding process. And in, using this way, we can pretty well monitor system activity as well. Uh, this is what it would look like uh, when it was implemented. Uh, this is a, an example of a simple uh, inline hook where we jump to our uh, rootkit code from the beginning of the, uh, of the function. Uh, there we do our filtering, collecting our processes, threads, uh, et cetera, et cetera. As you can see here, the, the original instructions that were overwritten have to be here in order uh, so that it works and it's not corrupt. And then we return or jump back to the original function after collecting what we need to collect. There are many, many other ways of uh, mo monitoring system activity as well. Uh, here are just a few examples. There's the PSP CID table, uh, which contains references, references to all processes and threads in the system. Uh, the CSRSS uh, process under normal conditions also uh, contains handles to all threads and processes in the system. Uh, handle table list, just like we show that e-thread uh, or e-process structures are linked. Uh, there are many such uh, double linked lists in the kernel. Uh, which can also be used for enumeration processes uh, purposes as well. Then there's the official way uh, by registering a notify routine whenever a uh, process or a thread uh, is created or terminated. Then we can hook sysenter, which is responsible uh, for the transition from user mode to kernel mode and many other methods. It's only up to our imagination. Obviously, uh, processes aren't the only thing uh, that rootkits would want to try to hide. And there's files, there's registry keys, loaded drivers, network con connections, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but the approaches are pretty similar to what we've shown before. There would be some methods using dynamical object manipulation. There would be hooking and other things like that. Now, as, I've, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, let's look at which of these methods have actually been used in malware, which were only proof of concepts. A uh, little bit of uh, history. Uh, the whole process hiding era began with uh, Greg Hogland's anti rootkit. He also uh, founded the rootkit.com website where many proof of concepts can be found. There's the FU rootkit, which introduced uh, the unlinking of uh, e process structures. Uh, some other contestants are over here. Uh, virtualization is a chapter. Uh, of its own, it can be used, it's a technology just like any other and it can be used both for uh, good and malicious purposes as well. Uh, one main purpose probably is uh, for anti-debugging techniques uh, where through binary translation, uh, through binary translation you can uh, translate your code into an alternative or customized instruction set, which is being interpreted by the hypervisor or the virtual machine monitor, if you will. And uh, this makes an analyst job a lot harder. Uh, as far as rootkits are concerned, uh, you, can, uh, you can install your rootkit as a hypervisor, which lies at a, at a in, in a lower level as uh, the kernel. And uh, this way, you could uh, pretty, well, pretty well control the operating system. You can think of it as a ring minus one. So many of these proof of concepts and uh, the things that we've demonstrated actually appeared in real world mal malware. Uh, namely, SSDT hooking, it is popular in malware, also in legitimate software. And uh, that's one type of malware uses such techniques. Uh, however, this is, only, this is only a smaller proportion of the things we see out there. Uh, the most, most malware out there uses a lot more simple, a lot more primit primitive techniques, but which often prove to be pretty sufficient. And the great, great, great advantage to these techniques is that they are less suspicious. Obviously, if you're trying to hide something and it, it automatically raises a red flag that is probably malicious. And uh, I'll show those techniques in the later slide. They're pretty obvious, but they're quite, quite efficient. And then there are the more advanced methods, which are used by uh, the bad guys I'll talk about later on, Mebrut, Wustok, Olmarik, which are quite interesting, I think. So the primitive stealth would require no hiding. 
of processes. You can hide in plain sight. You can uh, misspell. Uh, misspell your executables and you don't need to hide them. For example, this fools 99% of uh, the typical typical users. Uh, they make clever, clever folder choices and uh, the most, uh, most of malware uh, uses remote code, code injection. Why would you need to hide your process if you can inject into a legitimate process? Uh, it also, also has the benefit that if you inject into a trusted process like malware most often does, uh, such as Explorer or Internet Explorer, uh, you also get the advantage of uh, being able to bypass firewalls. Okay, enough of the, the boring stuff. Let's uh, get on to a real malware, serious malware, which actually caused some damage and uh, stole uh, millions of dollars from users and stole banking credentials, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, Mebroot is the first one that we'll be talking about today. Uh, its most characteristic thing is uh, getting loaded with by infecting the master boot record. Now, uh, as I said in the beginning, uh, this, it's, it's about stealing money and it's not anymore about uh, hackers bragging off and showing off, but this method isn't new and actually comes from back from those days uh, where the MS-DOS viruses uh, used this method and it was the only method basically uh, how to get uh, loaded and run after startup because there were no run register keys and et cetera, et cetera. So this concept lay dormant for pretty much for 20 years afterwards it was resurrected uh, in the EI boot root project. Uh, later on, in two, two, two years later, uh, the V boot kit followed, which was also able to uh, protect uh, Vista's new protection schemes. And uh, then Mebroot got its inspiration from these. It began appearing uh, late 2007. And then afterwards there was the V boot kit 2, uh, which could also subvert Windows 7, and then the infamous uh, Stone Bootkit by Kleisner. So Mebroot itself uh, has undergone heavy development, and it was a tug of war between the, the AV industry and the malware writers. Its uh, main purpose was uh, to support the banking, the banker, uh, Cinewall, which is, and the, this pair, this malicious pair, is responsible for stealing lots of money. As I said, its most distinguishing aspect uh, is the infected MBR. And it, but apart from that, it also uses uh, quite, a, quite a few neat stealth techniques, which I'll mention as well. So uh, this diagram illustrates uh, the boot process of a Mebroot infected machine. Uh, the red boxes uh, represent uh, the malicious, malicious code, whereas the, I think they're white on the projector, uh, they represent the regular, uh, regular boot uh, boot uh, bootloader code. Uh, so the so the first uh, first thing to execute after you turn on your PC is the infect NBR. Uh, it does it, the whole process uh, consists of several steps, as you can see, and several hooks uh, take place. Uh, and what the infected NBR is responsible for is to load uh, these sectors, these two, uh, from the end uh, from the the end of the hard drives, the raw sectors, uh, which uh, have been located in sector 60 and sector 61, for example. Uh, the clean master boot record is loaded from sector 62. Uh, this, these sectors actually have been changed with some uh, Mebroot variants, so, but the overall idea remained pretty much the same. Uh, and uh, the most important thing that uh, the infected MBR does is that it hooks uh, interrupt 13. I'll just, in a while, I'll mention what uh, that hooked interrupt 13 does. Uh, after, after it does all these things, uh, it uh, returns the flow, uh, it runs the actual clean MBR, which uh, was backed up, and then the regular, pretty much regular uh, boot, boot uh, sequence follows from the MBR to the boot sector, uh, for example, of the NTF NTFS uh, file system. Uh, that is responsible for loading uh, the NT loader, and it does that uh, by using interrupt 13. Now, when this interrupt 13 uh, is executed, it does some more hooking. And uh, in, this, in this case, it uh, hooks the OS loader and tells it that when it's, uh, it scans it for a specific signature in the code, and uh, when it's run, it tells it to execute this part. So afterwards, after that's done, uh, the OS loader uh, is run and it calls a section of the code which uh, is nicknamed the kernel patcher because it it hooks uh, the, the actual kernel executable. 
uh, when, the, when the kernel is run, that itself executes the payload loader of uh, Mebroot. And uh, that one actually loads, loads the malicious drivers. It uh, calls the driver entry point. And after doing all the nasty stuff, it returns back to the kernel. Now, you might be asking why this whole sequence is uh, so complicated and takes uh, so, so many steps. Well, the reason is the transition from 16-bit after you turn on your PC to 32-bits or 64-bits, and uh, the transition from real mode to protected mode. Okay, uh, Mebroot's uh, stealth techniques. Uh, in the beginning, we've mentioned hotting of processes, registry files, registry keys, files, etc., etc. Mebroot doesn't need to do that because it simply doesn't use them. Uh, instead, it stores this data in physical raw sectors on the disk, and uh, this is the part that needs to be hidden, uh, so that uh, when you when you use some your your favorite tool. Uh, such as WinHex to look at the hard drive contents. So this should be, uh, these bytes should be faked. Uh, another thing that Mebroot is trying to hide is this network communication, which, which operates slow at the end is level. Okay, so the way Mebroot did this was, well, the first versions uh, simply hooked the IRP function, the dispatch functions uh, in the disk sys driver. The read major function was hooked uh, so that it returned the clean version of the master boot record whenever, whenever that was queried, and uh, so that it returned zeros instead of the malicious code at the, uh, in, the, you know, in the infected uh, sectors of the hard drive. Uh, the major, write major function was hooked for protection of uh, the code so that it wouldn't be overwritten and it wouldn't be cleaned by uh, anti-rootkit or antivirus software. Uh, this was pretty easy to, uh, to defeat. Well, as you can see here, uh, it's, it's pretty clear that uh, these functions are malicious. They are not what they're supposed to be. So Mebrut obviously improved their techniques. This was only the beginning. Uh, and what it did was that it, it hooked all of these, all of these functions so that wouldn't uh, be as obvious. Uh, furthermore, it also modified the original pointers because what detection tools did was that they compared the actual uh, pointers in memory with the expected values. So uh, Mebroot also changed the expected values that were used for comparison. They're stored, stored in the class PMP sys driver and also as a reference in the CD-ROM driver, for example. Uh, later on, uh, Mebroot improved in such a way that it uh, went lower with its hooking. And instead of hooking the disk, disk sys driver, it hooked uh, ATAP sys, ACPI sys, or uh, VMS CI sys, depending on the ha hardware platform. Uh, furthermore, it also installed and uninstalled their hooks when necessary. So uh, they only had the hooks in place when the disk object, object handle was opened, so that apart, uh, whenever you scanned for the hooks, the system would be clean. Uh, then there is such uh, the concept of uh, owning the device, which have, has been improved by Almeric, and I'll be talking more about that later. And then Mebri also implemented some self-defense mechanisms, such as reinfecting the master boot record upon Windows shutdown, so that when, if, it, if it was restored by some security software, it would, it would reinfect itself. Uh, defeating Mebroot uh, required knowing where to look. We know that it... Uh, Use the master boot record, so that would be a place to look. It hooked the interrupt table. Uh, we could look in the DOS memory because it loads at a really early stage and it uh, leaves a trace behind. And most of the and in these cases, uh, standard signature based detection works pretty well. Okay, let's go to Rustock. Now, again, this this was a pretty serious malware. Has undergone uh, heavy development. There were several uh, versions A, B, C, D, if you want. Uh, its purpose was a spam botnet, but uh, the architecture was uh, really was so advanced for its time that uh, it could be used pretty much for anything. It would be that that, that the author, uh, authors intended: password stealing, DOS attacks, whatever. Uh, the most distinguishing feature is its uh, advanced protector uh, of the driver, and I'll be talking more uh, about that in more detail. Uh, just like most malware, it consists of uh, several components, the user mode parts responsible uh, for the payload, spam distribution, botnet communication, etc., etc., et and the rootkit part, which is responsible for hiding. 
Uh, Rootkit itself was implemented, again, just like Mebrood, without file processes or registry entries. Uh, Rootkit can be class, uh, Rootstock can be classified as a virus because it infects uh, various system drivers. And an interesting feature is that it travels from one driver to another and it uh, disinfects one and infects the other one. So you don't uh, really know where exactly to look. And uh, this driver infection is what needed to be hidden by Rootstock. The way Rootstock did this was that uh, it camouflaged the infection by installing uh, file system hooks, for example, in the N NTFS driver. Uh, obviously in such a way that the original driver bytes were returned uh, falsified instead of uh, the, the actual malicious bytes. Uh, instead of hooking the IRP functions as we've shown with Mebroot, uh, inline hooks uh, were used which are, which are a bit harder to spot. Uh, more, more, more the case when they were placed after some garbage instructions uh, at the beginning of uh, the trampoline function so that when uh, uh, several uh, detection tools only look at, looked at the beginning of the function, they wouldn't recognize the infection. Also, uh, firewall by by bypassing uh, was done by hooking the uh, networking drivers. The DLL components also needed to be hidden. Uh, the DLLs are injected into system processes and uh, this is hidden by hooking some native API functions, but unlike uh, the methods which we've uh, mentioned in the beginning, SSDT hooking, which is really trivial to overcome. Uh, uh, Rootstock uh, hooked uh, key fast call entry, which is, uh, which, which, is, which is the system dispatcher, system call dispatcher. And newer versions did quite an interesting thing. Uh, every thread has its own po uh, pointer to the SSDT table. Uh, so what uh, Rootstock did was that it created a copy of the SSDT and modified this pointer uh, so that it uh, pointed to that copy of the SSDT and this way the SSDT was clean, was clean and whenever it was scanned uh, it wouldn't ring any alarms. And obviously the, D the DLL was also removed from the process envir environment block. Uh, Rootstock also uses some nice uh, self-defense techniques, uh, anti-debugging -deb techniques, uh, checking for uh, debugger, KD debugger enabled, uh, searches the memory for uh, debugger related strings, strings uh, clears hardware breakpoints, uh, makes checksums of its code to detect uh, any breakpoints. And uh, what's quite interesting, I think, is that it registered a callback function on a BSOD so that it would clear the memory so that it couldn't be analyzed with a crash dump. And this is the most important part. Uh, the Rootstock's driver protector uh, uses uh, heavy obfuscation and is compressed and encrypted with RC4. And what's most, most interesting is that the key is hardware related. So uh, the infector, the downloader that gets you infected uh, creates your own unique customized copy of Rootstock. Uh, I think uh, the hardware key is dependent on the PCI bus. And uh, this makes analyst's job a bit harder because it doesn't, doesn't run on our replicators and uh, a lot more effort is uh, required to get it to run. Uh, detecting Rootstock uh, requires, again, knowing where to look. Uh, the infected driver is a weakness because uh, if you look at a low enough level, you can spot it. And uh, that, that's, that's uh, one, one way of uh, detecting Rootstock. Also, the injected DLL can be detected rather easily. Now, uh, TDL, aka Olmarik, is uh, the youngest member uh, of these uh, rootkits that we'll be talking about, and therefore also the most advanced because it uh, took uh, reliable code from its pre predecessors and built upon on that and created uh, pretty ne neat and nasty tricks of its own. Uh, the, the authors uh, ceaselessly developed uh, their masterpiece uh, the first versions began appearing in the middle of 2008 and uh, the latest one, TDL4, is pretty recent. Uh, we spotted the variants in July this year, so it's about only about two months old. Uh, the payload is that it tries to block uh, antivirus uh, products, uh, has backdoor and botnet functionality, but most importantly, it acts as a downloader. And uh, you can think of it as a hotel, a haven for third-party malware, so it provides, uh, kind of provides a service. Uh, to other malware so, so that it hides it from antiviruses 
so it sells these uh, rootkit techniques. Uh, some installation tricks uh, which uh, Mebert uses, uh, which TDL uses, sorry, is by uh, installing itself as a printer processor. This technique has been adopted by uh, a lot of malware afterwards. And uh, there is also the typical obfuscation, anti-debugging. Uh, an interesting trick is that it hooked its own import address table uh, during unpacking of its driver. So that uh, during static analysis, uh, when you would uh, see you know, a typical function for, I don't know, allocating memory, uh, it uh, could slip, uh, slip your attention uh, because in reality, it would, it would do something totally different, such as uh, unpacking of the malicious code. Uh, Olmaric, similarly, like Rustock, infected a uh, system driver, in this case a storage miniput driver, uh, depending on the platform again, but most commonly at, uh, at a PCs, uh, but improved uh, quite a large deal. Uh, only a small loader stub was written in the resource section of the driver this time, and this enabled uh, the fact that the file size remained unchanged, unlike Rustock, where uh, the infected driver was uh, many, many times larger than the original uh, file. Dri the driver entry point is re redirected to point to that stub, and uh, that stub uh, is responsible for locating and calling uh, the rootkit code located uh, in, the in the file system of uh, TDL. We'll talk uh, more about the file system, of course, because that's its most uh, distinguishing feature. And uh, it uses a callback function to load the rootkit body uh, because uh, at the time of loading of this driver the file system is not yet ready so it registers a, a, a file a callback function so that it does loading uh, whenever the file system is loaded uh, lo load of the, this access uh, is uh, possible through ac uh, accessing the drive at an SESI level and uh, the malware pretty much named itself uh, by using the TDL string uh, marking the beginning of the rootkit sectors at the end of the drive. Okay, so the file system which uh, TDL3 began implementing uh, was an own hidden file system. It's RC4 encrypted in uh, most of the variants. Some variants uh, it wasn't encrypted at all. Some variants uh, actually use simple XOR. Uh, the reasons for that uh, were in order to make the loader stub as small as possible and uh, keep the infected uh, driver the same size as before. So import uh, address resolution functions were uh, removed and instead the, uh, the necessary system functions were addressed directly by their RVAs. Uh, the file system uh, can, can be seen in this screenshot, the TDLD uh, marker signifies uh, the root directory. Uh, then there are several fi files that you can see there. Uh, there's the configuration file. Uh, there's TDL, which uh, didn't appear in the very early variants, where the rootkit body was stored uh, as raw, raw data at the end of the drive after the file, uh, the, the hidden file, uh, file system. Uh, but later versions uh, actually placed this in a file. Uh, resource uh, dat is the backup of the resources, so whenever, whenever the infected driver was scanned, uh, the falsified data could be returned. And then there, there, and there are some uh, files downloaded from the internet third party stuff, uh, and then there's the user mode component which is injected into processes. Uh, the way these, uh, these files were accessed, these are some of the paths uh, from different uh, TDL versions where ABCDFG is a random eight uh, character string which changes uh, all the time upon every reboot. Uh, in the latest, uh, latest example, there are two strings where you can think of the first one as a name visible to everyone and the second one as a, as a key. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, all my authors uh, worked a lot on their, on their code uh, from, I think, September 2009 to about February, March of this year. Uh, many, many variants have come out. And uh, sometimes like two or three variants per week, which uh, gave us pretty much, but uh, detection, detection uh, was uh, successful. 
uh, and uh, the techniques, the techniques uh, have improved a lot. Uh, so basically, as we've said, uh, the file system is what needs to be hidden. Uh, new, newer version no longer hooked the RP routines, but did a uh, pretty, ne pretty nice trick uh, owning the device, uh, stealing the device uh, of the infected drive uh, from the ATAP sys. I mean, it, over it has overwritten this pointer, uh, created a copy of uh, the driver object, and uh, also obviously modified uh, the necessary uh, object headers so that it wouldn't be visible uh, by using Windows Debugger, for example. Uh, the k-user shared data uh, kernel structure, it's a data structure which is uh, shared between kernel and uh, user mode memory. Mm, that's a place where uh, TDL, some versions of TDL, not, not all of them, uh, had stored some pointers uh, to its dispatch functions. Uh, many of you has, have probably uh, noticed uh, the blue screen of death after, after the MS-1015 patch. And uh, that was caused uh, by what I've mentioned earlier, that uh, in order that uh, the loader accessed uh, kernel functions directly by their RVAs, uh, this patch modified the kernel so uh, those ad addresses became uh, corrupt and crashed the system. What's interesting is that mo both Microsoft uh, called down the patch uh, and fixed it, and as well as as well as uh, TDL's authors in order to make their code, code reliable. They slightly gave up the TDL marker, which uh, gave it off, and uh, use it, used some uh, more advanced techniques, such as uh, uh, several, some, like referencing its code by using uh, their function addresses which change upon every startup. And just like Rustock did, uh, some TDL versions are able to infect different, different drivers, not only ATA PCs, which makes it, uh, again, quite interesting. Now, let's get to less serious things. Uh, all my Rick's authors uh, have a sense of humor. They use uh, interesting uh, debug strings. Uh, they, they implement a self-defense thread, obviously, uh, as their serious malware. Uh, their self-defense thread monitors its hooks. It monitors uh, the infection peri uh, periodically in a cycle. Uh, the loop time uh, have ch has changed uh, through ver uh, different variants. It was, I think, every, once every 10 seconds in the beginning, then they shortened, shortened the time to five, once every five seconds, every three seconds. And uh, whenever a re removal attempt is uh, detected, uh, the debug string run forest run is uh, displayed, and uh, when, the, when the changes are reversed, uh, your powers are weak, old man, is displayed as a debug print. Uh, there are many other funny debug, debug messages from the author's favorite films, such as Five Club, uh, Homer Simpson, Bender's Bite My Shiny Metal Ass. Uh, they use unconventional error codes uh, upon a successful installation and infection of the system, status secret too long, status too many secrets, and fun things like that. What's less fun is that TDL 4 became 64-bit, which uh, is pretty, pretty much bad news, but could have, could have actually uh, been expected and was only a matter of time that we began seeing 64-bit uh, malware. Uh, as I said, the uh, TDL3 versions uh, were updated uh, heavily up to February, March this year, and then suddenly, suddenly we've, we've seen less of the versions, but uh, the spring of this year was only the quiet before the storm, uh, where in July uh, we've detected uh, TDL4 uh, with its 64-bit uh, Capable root, capable root, capable root kits. Uh, they're actually be, actually able to infect both 32-bit uh, and 64-bit systems. Uh, the 64-bit systems, which are thought to be more reliable and more secure, uh, TDL is able to bypass both driver signature verific verification and patch guard. And uh, guess what it does? Just like member did, it affects the master boot record. Uh, to in order to overcome these new security features. Uh, the basic functionality pretty much remains the same. Uh, only the files have changed, uh, in the file system have changed somewhat. Uh, config INI is uh, now CFG INI. Uh, there are the different versions of uh, the drivers and the DLLs for 32-bit and 64-bit. Uh, and the loader, uh, the loader is uh, according to the new, new uh, Windows 7 and 64-bit 
uh, loader, the 16-bit, the 32-bit, the 64-bit parts. Uh, this graph uh, illustrates uh, the trend that we've seen in the past two years. Uh, it's, a rel th it's relative detection shares, so uh, MEBR, Rootstock, and Olmeric all together are 100%. Uh, you can see that uh, over two years ago, uh, MEBR and Rootstock were pretty much tied uh, up to the point where uh, Olmeric came later, and ever since that point, uh, it had the greatest share of among all these, all these uh, three menaces. Uh, over here, we can see a uh, temporary outbreak of Rootstock, but the trend uh, up to the present date is that uh, Olmarik is leading. So in conclusion, uh, we can think of this whole game as an advanced version of hide and seek, uh, cat and mouse game between the AV industry and the malware writers. Uh, it, it has actually the most uh, technically challenging uh, battle because uh, this malware is, poses the greatest challenge for detection. Uh, what is interesting is that uh, compared to other, all the malware out there, the hundreds of thousands of uh, samples, unique samples daily, uh, the ones with rootkit capabilities uh, have a relatively low share, but uh, with, the, with the outbreak of uh, TDL, this trend is actually slightly changing, so who knows what the future will bring. That's it for me today, and if you have any questions, say them now. Yes. Uh, my question would be if, um, uh, if I run a virtual machine like on VMware or something mm -hmm. in my computer, is your rootkit able to break out of it into the There have been several proof of concepts about that, but it's uh it is pretty difficult. Uh, there have been some papers about it and uh, written by academia, but it's uh, not typical things that, we've see, that we see in the wild. Uh, can you rephrase the question? Yeah. Are, you, are you talking, which one are you talking about? Yes. So if you had the kernel actually checking the MVR for it, Yeah. Well, it, it should do that if it worked proper, properly, obviously. Okay, thank you very much. Yes? Uh, that you uh, not uh, mm, see in wild that uh, some uh, virus uh, from the virtual computer uh, infect the host computer. It, you never see anything? No, we've, we've seen proof of concepts and academia work about that. Uh, the, mo the most common, uh, common uh, virtualization abuse is uh, anti-debugging. So uh, just like Themida does, uh, running its code in a hypervisor, that's the most typical thing that, that's in the wild. Okay, thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks.